Nice. Sean Mugum. Awesome. Welcome yeah. to the show. Thank you. My pleasure. How are you doing? I'm great, bro. I love what okay. we were just talking about a moment ago before we started. We were talking about how we have accrued a database, a library of content on our YouTube channels and our books about what enlightenment or awakening is. And now that can act as a resource for all of our other selves that are interested in this topic. And yeah. that's, that's awesome. And one of your books um, is titled The Truth About Spiritual Enlightenment. And I love that. And I'd love to um, start things off by asking you, um, what have you found um, across your different angles on this theme to be awakening? Mm. Well, um, the most important thing would be the freedom from the conceptual reality that people are stuck in. Because uh, we grow up learning the language, learning concepts about the world. So we create a representation of the world inside us. And we create beliefs about everything, including the person that you think you are. And that is like a story, you know, a story a bundle of thoughts, emotions, memories, you know, everything. We get identified with it. And no matter what we read, even when, you, when we read spiritual things, we always tend to take everything conceptually, another concept to save in the memory, identify with. But yeah, the first thing was, you know, in 2002, there was a realization, um, you know, a realization of an understanding of what spirituality is really all about. It, is, it has got nothing to do with the books that I have studied so far in my life. I was memorizing concepts, you know, uh, and uh, <laughs> maybe I sounded cool when I mentioned those words like, you know, moksha, mukti and samadhi, things like that. But I didn't have anything in my experience. And the, the most, you know, like shocking realization was that it has got nothing to do with the story that I'm identified with, the story that I'm trying to improve, you know, that story doesn't even exist. It's like just a story, bundle of thoughts. So that was in 2002, I think. It was like a, a glimpse, you know, uh, realize, realizing the possibility, the potential. That relieved me a lot, even though I still suffered much. I think I feel that there's like an insurance or something. I don't lose anything. And then it continued, you know, for 12 years. And after that, it was like mind blowing. It was for me, it was like hitting a reset button. It was like that. When somebody hits a reset button on your brain, you know, you lose all the conditioning. Suddenly you become like a child. Uh, everything is pure as if you were just born, you know, and uh, you don't think about tomorrow. That's how it was. So it was, it has got to do with, it, it is very simple. No concepts to remember, you know, no, uh, <laughs> it was not like, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a relief from a burden, lifelong burden. And uh, it entirely changed everything. And, uh, I can say that it gave me a new vision and new strength, new strength to sustain whatever that happens, a new vision. And uh, that also opened me up to endless possibilities, you know, mind blowing and beyond words, like, you know, never thought as possible. Yeah. Love that, bro. So good. And it plays perfectly into the Pali, um, the Buddha teachings, where uh, Nibbana is unweaving or unbinding or unfabricating. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. similar with Nipapanka is the same, right? So you're not mentally proliferating, which is yeah, yeah, yeah. self, others, world stories all of that mm. and so then like the reeling back of the mental proliferation so there's no fabrication mm. there's no weaving there's no story mm. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. has been 
recently so like um, revelatory and a huge shout out to Rob Berbea um, and actually Frank Yang, who pointed me to Rob Berbea um, in his book, um, Seeing That Freeze, Meditations on Emptiness and Dependent Arising. And it's, it's really when we um, reel it back, reel it back, what is in innermost direct experience? <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and that's beautiful, bro. And, um, and it's also really nice because now we can, instead of getting stuck at one of the conceptual layers, like you said, which I think is so important also, like, ah, Samadhi and like getting stuck yeah. on, on that. Mm -hmm. And, um, a pranayama, um, Anapanasati, like, oh, be mindfulness of breath, you know, and just like, mm -hmm. you know, just like getting stuck with the meditator is still behind the eyes, you know, type thing. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. there's all of these layers that we can still get uh, stuck in. And I love that. That's great. So now from the place of awakening a realization where there's no um, story that's operating the show let's say it's more like the freedom. Yeah. it's like freedom spontaneity purity childlikeness yes yes yeah to so, so talk about that for a bit like um that natural state yeah mm. yeah it is like you can see things in a in a very simple way you know um what many people struggle with like for example i'll tell you just one example maybe the fear of failure you know, people do not try things just because they think that they will fail. And a lot of people don't do a lot of things, you know, don't do efforts just because of this. And that is tied to the self-concept or the narrative. When you don't have that narrative, you don't really have the fear of failure. You can pretty much do anything you want, right? So it is just like that. Just like how a child, you know, learns to walk. It falls down, gets up, walks again. And... It's, it's fun for the child, but we, when, when, when human beings fall down, it is like, a, you know, they have to recover. They take a long time, you know, and there is a lot of rumination, a lot of uh, stories going on in the head. It always happens to me, you know, and that reduces your ability to try the next time. But when you don't have such a story, when you are not bound by it, you can just do anything, you know. But initially, there was an absence of intention. Uh, like I didn't want to do anything at all. Like there is no do nothing anymore. That, that's what, that's how I initially felt. And a lot of people actually have this question. Like, you know, there is an, a complete absence of any intention at all, how to get over it. And it actually happens by itself. You know, you finally figure out because the, the demands, whatever life you're living, there are always demands that you have to meet. You have to pay your bills. You have to meet somebody the next week, you know? So you have to actually do something in order to meet those demands. And you train your brain again, and it happens automatically. It is like you know, training your brain to think about the future, to plan things in advance, to try to change things, even though you still accept everything as it is perfectly. You still need to change things in the world, right? So uh, these days, you know, I just like, I have very much adapted to that, very much adapted to planning, you know, doing some action, because, you know, I, I have, I've been doing a lot of things which I never imagined possible, like going to the gym, you know, working out and things like that. And it's all fun. I don't think about the results. And that's exactly how I get results. You know, not getting fixated on where you need to reach, what we need to become. So, yeah, that's beautiful. It's very simple, you know. Yeah. So yeah, and uh, the focus uh, for my in my first book, you know, uh, I mainly focused on connecting science and spirituality, how we can approach the whole subject in a scientific way. And it is possible. Many people think that it is not possible because spirituality and science is separate. But we already have a field called psychology. We study mind, the body, and there is transpersonal psychology, which studies spiritual experiences and transformation so i think you know that is like that will be the, the next step in the spiritual 
uh, you know, what is going on in the world. We will make more scientific approach, you know, scientific way of thinking about this awakening. Because when it's thought about in religious way, a lot, there is a lot of confusion, a lot of misunderstanding, clashes, you know, things like that. So that's the barrier for people who really want to transform their lives. So cool because you and I both are fascinated by the synthesis of science and spirituality, which you could say is one of the core interests of the one because of God, because what is more interesting than the consciousness plus physicalism merging together or science and spirituality merging together or um, the psychology or the mind merging with the matter or the external, the internal plus the external, um, the comprehender of creation, right? And there's nothing cooler than to be able to synthesize those two. Uh, and I, Shinzen Young called it the centuries trillion dollar idea. And I very mm -hmm. much, I very much agree with that. And as you were listing transpersonal psychology, that's also a place where um, I got really excited uh, around like, yeah, maybe like three, three or so years ago. And um, that's a key entry point on the getting interested in consciousness from a scientific way, um, for sure. I love that you brought that up. And I could even go and say that um, there will potentially be more um, ways to add to it by maybe calling it like decentralized psychology or universal psychology or something like that. Um, and mm -hmm, there's that. And then um, I also, in my first book, High Level Perception, authored a good chunk of it on the synthesis of science and spirituality. So again, it's no, no, uh, okay, yeah, it's, it's a perfect alignment for you and I to be in this uh, conversation together. And also that the, the way that we can basically measure in a sense, the, let's say the biometrics of like enlightened or awakened sages, um, we can see that the levels of rumination or the levels of story, the levels of self, um, are not mm. present and then we can measure that via eegs and fmris and whatnot we can take that and then we can leverage that as like a biometric biomarker for awakening and then we can yeah yeah that type of thing too so there's a synthesis available there which is really important as well mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's something that I have in mind. That that is the idea that I have. Like you know, so um, in the future, maybe in the science, we'll find a lot of people record their uh, brain state. You know, like how their brain has changed. Uh, you know, so that that way we will narrow down the neural correlates of uh, the awakening. What exactly happens in the brain, and then we can actually have that as a a way to find out if somebody has reached the same level of transformation or not. You know. The, the same awakening. There is already a good progress. Uh, you know, in, in my book, I have a chapter on science and spirituality. And uh, we have some idea. For example, there is a, a book that I have written about, introduced that book, which is about the left brain interpreter. That is in our left brain. Left brain is a seat of language. And there is a function in the left brain. It is called as left brain interpreter that creates the story. It connects past and future. and uh, it main, tries to maintain a consistency, right? And we need, maybe, you know, uh, we evolved it for survival because we needed that consistency because that consistency put together all the experiences. This is me, this is my past, and I shouldn't repeat these mistakes in the future in order to survive. But we probably overdid it because in, in, in our times, whatever that was scars, you know, 
that is available a lot. We have a lot of food and we have obesity. We have a lot of uh, things in our story. You know, the story is very, very heavy. We have added too much to it. And that is making us suffer. And this left brain interpreter is what is responsible for the story. And yeah, we, you know, that is a very interesting topic, actually. So I wanted to mention that something that has a good potential for doing more research on. I like how it can be as simple as we have added too much story and that makes us suffer. And then the neural, yeah. the neural correlates of the story making, which you feel is in the, um, the left hemisphere. Yeah. Yeah. Left brain interpreter is the, the word. The left brain. It is like there is a mm -hmm. interpreter. Yeah. It is like, you know, it seems for me, you know, uh, as I understand, it seems like, you know, the left brain interpreter and then the prefrontal cortex and default mode network. It is a network in the brain. They all work together. Uh, the left brain interpreter creates the story. Prefrontal cortex uses that story to plan for the future to make plans, you know, to delay gratification and things like that. And default mode network is the network that gets activated when we are idle. So we get reminded about things that we need to do. And that is good if it is very little, like, you know, adding some salt in the recipe. You know, I use usually use an analogy, like the salt in the ocean water and the salt that is required in a very tasty sandwich or whatever pizza, whatever snack that you like. So we have like, you know, just like having too much salt, we have too much of that, too much of planning, too much of uh, uh, agenda, to-do list, and that has become very, very heavy, you know. So uh, basically we are resetting the whole thing. The story is we are taking the brain away from all this identification. And then again, we have to train our brain consciously to do use the prefrontal cortex, default mode network, everything in a very productive way, in a much more, you know, creative way. It is like designing your own life. So it becomes an art rather than an unconscious way of living and suffering. So that's very beautiful, you know. Mm. Like, uh, yeah. It is like you become the artist of your own life, create whatever you want. You know? And uh, one more thing is that, you know, when you are after this awakening, the shift, it is like, you don't, you have already found what you're looking for in life in general. So the ultimate question of life has been answered. What is there in this life? You know, what is ultimately I want is, has been answered. Now you're free to take your time and do things, you know, without any fear. I mean, the existential fear or insecurity about what the future is going to be is remote. And that actually makes you more free to do things in a very efficient way. And, uh, I can see it uh, as uh, something which is very true because I, I struggled a lot when I was a child, emotional problems, you know, like a uh, lot of things, rejection sensitivity and uh, trying to be normal. That is one thing that I was struggling with. I should be like, you know, everybody else. And uh, now, and that actually, you know, created a lot of uh, problems in my performance. I couldn't perform, I couldn't speak, I couldn't, social anxiety and things like that. But I ended up writing a book, starting a channel that I never imagined all these things as possible. And it is this awakening which gave me that strength, you know. When you forget about the story, the person that you are identified with, everything happens. There is a higher power that takes over many things. You don't even have to worry about it, you know. So, so good, bro. Woo. Um, love that. Um, yeah, we could say that when um, the, the stress about self um, relaxes, that higher intelligence, we could say this infinite intelligence, um, more effortlessly, like Lao Tzu called it Wu Wei, this very effortless action, this flow. It's so natural. Mm, yeah. Um, and then also, um, I love how um, one of the main reasons why that flow can um, really just 
be effortless is because like you said, the ultimate question of life is answered. And yes. that was the fire, you know, um, Ramana and uh, Papaji uh, talked about it like a, um, a flame under the ass that is fanned, that you know, it's kindled. Yeah. Right? Um, and then that, like, I want to know myself. I want to know myself. I want to know my true nature. Pew! Like the moth dissolves into the flame of the infinite singularity. And then, um, yeah, so cool. And then, and then the expression of life from that perspective can then be whole. It can be pure. It can be um, in, in service to life, awakening to itself. Yeah. And yeah. that's the key thing. And then another key thing you brought up, which I feel is um, really important, is um, this, when we talk about the one infinite creator, uh, we talk about it like a stylist. It's like the painter. And so become the artist of your life yes. consciously instead of the unconscious programming and so there's like a liberation from the matrix conditioning, basically, that is a huge yeah. part of this awakening. And it, um, it, a lot of it has to do with liberating ourselves of the patterns of conditioning of the matrix that have kept us asleep for so long. And so the classic thing is like 10 years ago or 20 years ago for, for, for people is you begin looking at, well, what is money? Like, what is that? Yeah. Like, what the hell is that thing? Um, uh, who owns money? Um, and another one is um, like, what is time? That's another big one. Um, yeah. So anyway, these fundamental questions can create shifts. Like, do I really believe what the media polarized propaganda um why am I picking a side against another side that's in my same country or whatnot? This type of thing. Um, so yeah. these, yeah, these basic ones can help you like liberate more into that like effortless, free stylus of creation. And then another thing you mentioned, I think so important is, did you say, let me see if I can get this right. So the left brain interpreter creates the story. Yeah. Then... Yeah. The PFC, the prefrontal cortex, uses the story. And then the, de the default mode network ruminates on the story. Yeah, yeah. It is like, you know, default mode network uh, is like, we get reminders, actually. It is, that is how it is supposed to be. Reminders about things that we need to do. All these reminders are associated with the feeling emotion okay and that's what is bothering us like oh i didn't do it i mean i'm not for example i'm single i don't have a, I, I have to find a girlfriend is a, something that you have to do but it comes with an emotion emotion of you know not being good enough or you know not being uh, something like that you know so everything has an emotional load so uh, uh yeah it is like all these three things work together but they are all overloaded the story is so big so heavy you know and the prefrontal cortex is overloaded. It can distract. It can get distracted very easily. And default mode network is also overloaded. Even when you're idle, you are you are under stress. When you're doing nothing, you can't really do nothing. You know, and uh, people often find ways to escape this silence. Like they don't want to be left with themselves. They can't sit in a room without doing anything. They have, they need a phone. They need a, somebody to talk to, movie or something like that. So because they can't phase the mind when it is not doing anything it brings all the worries and anxiety and everything yeah go on actually you're saying something i mean you're confirming if uh, i was you got you understood it right i mean this so, is so yeah, good go I, I was also just um feeling into like more um how you have identified this scientifically. I love that. Like you identified um, more of the scientific, let's say regions of the brain and activities of the brain that are what we talked about, what Buddha shared as a papanka, 
um, this like mental proliferation. Um, Reification, yeah. Yes, yes. And so if, um, if, if the left brain interpreter is this like explanation generation, let's say engine of sorts, um, then that can be like literally could be like Papanka might be like the left brain interpreter, like that explanation generation yeah. engine, this mental proliferation and conceptualization of self and yeah. others and world and stories endlessly. And then there's the prefrontal cortex using all of that explanation generation to usually to try and get something from the world to feel whole because it feels lack it feels separation, yeah. location, etc., yeah. and then, and then, and then that rumination of the default mode network. Um, uh, you you also said a reminder. Like I like that too. The default mode network is such a reminder. Like there's a moment of like yeah. peace, and all of a sudden you're being like getting reminded about the past or getting reminded about yeah. the future. Um, and then there's an there's a proliferation that happens into those webs. And then the whole thing is to just like whoop, boop, 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 Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. Because, you know, this, the, the default mode network, there is actually a good thing about it. Uh, usually it is thought of, thought of as a bad thing in spirituality because of this mind wandering and things like that. But mind wandering has a purpose. If it is a, you know, like it brings like you know uh, brings your attention to many things that you have forgotten about uh, even for creativity mind wandering is a very useful thing it is like you know you you're exploring everything that you know and everything that you can expect and uh, with a little bit of what what it is it is useful and since it is overloaded you know you're all messed up And uh, there is another uh, paper uh, written by Richard Boyle. You know, I want to mention this so that even uh, people would be aware. It is called Cracking the Buddhist Code. That is a very, uh, I, I'm very impressed by his work. Uh, Richard, his name is Richard P. Boyle. And uh, the paper is called as Cracking the Buddhist Code, a Contemporary Theory of First Stage Awakening. This might be of your interest and also, you know, people who are watching might find this interesting because he has a, this paper has uh, everything like, you know, he has identified things which mark this transformation and he has given names to it. Like, for example, you know, this absence of reification, you know, and uh, uh, the sense of separation, the ability to live in uncertainty, because that is one other thing that you get after the freedom. We have a lot of uncertainty about life why we are here that is uncertain in itself but we are able to come live in that uncertainty as if it is a play after transformation but before this the uncertainty looks very dangerous people want answers to everything to escape from this uncertainty but that is not the case after awakening you can live in a state of not knowing how the future is going to be whatever happens you can adapt to it no matter what happens tomorrow I am ready to, you know, flow along, you know, flow with the wave, like you're surfing in the ocean. You know? So, yeah. Okay, so a couple things here. Um, sure. One of them is, like you said, that once we sort of reel back on the mental proliferation, and we have an absence of reification, like you said, and like Richard said, then from there, we can use the left brain interpreter, the PFC and the DMN in their good yes. ways. We can use them in the good way. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. I think there is not enough awareness about this spot, especially how we have to, what needs to be done after awakening. Like, you know, many people actually ask about this one part, which is also mentioned by Richard, boil you know absence of intentionality that is a very important thing the intentionality is completely absent and this is somehow you know it uh, creates some kind of uh, like you know uh, other people are not probably they are not happy about what you're doing you know because everybody else thinks in a different way and you are not 
putting efforts to improve certain things because everything is fine for you. You accept everything. But then what, what you can do is like, you know, this, this planning, thinking about future is actually like a muscle. If you don't use it, it becomes weak, but you can train it again. But when you really train it and use it, when you harness the power, it, it, it is like, you know, you have swallowed the limitless drug. You can do anything. Because all you need is time. No matter what you want to do, you need time. Like, for example, if you want to write a book, it takes time. If you if you are spending that time without facing that anxiety, whether it will happen or not, what if it doesn't happen? What if it happens? My life will be like this. When this is absent, you can do your task, take your time, and it happens, you know, without any re resistance or any kind of uh, suffering that people go through. Recently, that's what I am thinking about, like, you know, how to use it the best. Uh, all the resources that you have in your body, in your brain, everything, you know. Uh, a lot of people, they, they get trained to use those things because the brain, it rewires itself according to what you are giving the input, you know. And everything can be taken advantage of, including watching movies. People watch movies for entertainment. But movies has a, if you're awakened, for example, movie has a different purpose now. When you, when you watch a movie, the movie exposes you to the forgotten world, what people struggle with, you know, different aspects of life, different aspects of uh, the problems that people around you face, it actually somewhat, you know, it does something to bridge the empathy gap, because empathy gap is a phenomenon, everybody has it. Uh, unless you and I have the same problem, I can't understand your problem much. That is called as empathy gap, it is a cognitive bias. And even though we say that uh, awakening uh, improves the empathy, and that's because you're able to see things without the filter of your own ego. Still, there is an empathy gap. You don't really, we don't really understand how much other people suffer because it is a forgotten story for people who have awakened. So these are the things that are not written about, talked about in our spiritual traditions. Maybe they talked about it, but they didn't write it down because it will confuse people. I don't know. But uh, you know, there, there are a lot of other possibilities for exploration in this field. You know, many things can be done. So yeah, it looks the, the possibilities looks amazing, mind blowing, you know. And uh, rather than trying to explain things to people, you have to show them what is possible. They will be amazed. Love that. My gosh. Yeah. Okay, so many good threads here. Um, so one of the ones that just came up a moment ago um, is to yeah. read. Um, I'm going to put the link to uh, Richard Boyle's um, paper in the uh, description of our video. And what I'm going to do right now is, yeah. and so people can read it, because I, I found what you just said uh, with sharing this to be so important. So let's go ahead and read, let's at least read the abstract of the paper to um, the audience. So Richard P. Boyle, Cracking the Buddhist Code, A Contemporary Theory of First Stage Awakening. Abstract. The theory proposes that what Buddhists call awakening is equivalent to pure perceptual experience or the awareness our perceptual systems would present to us if they acted without interference from our symbol processing systems. Two forms of interference are particularly apt to interfere, uncontrolled inner speech and the distortion of perception to fit reified conceptual structures. Uncontrolled inner speech has been linked with hyperactivity in the default mode network, DMN, which occurs when attentional demands are low. Reification occurs universally as children construct their own social reality from the culture into which they are born. Both the DMN and reification are products of evolutionary processes, trapping us in social reality and preventing us from entering perceptual reality. Research indicates that both sources of interference can be overcome through special practices and training. However, 
And people who have experienced first stage awakening report a pattern of features that is consistent with this theory. So you guys can find yeah. this link in the bio below to read this. Um, this is a great recommendation, Sean Mugam. So good. Um, cool. So I'll stop. Thank you. You sharing? Yes, yeah, such a good one. And it's great to just even take a bit to, to read that together. So, um, so that and then another powerful thing that came up was when, um, when we talk about the absence of reification or the absence of intentionality, what comes up for me immediately is shunyata, emptiness. And it's almost like we, we reel the, the expression of life backward into its source, you could say, into this black hole, this void. And then because we've now tasted that, we now know ourselves as that, we've maybe even bathed in it, but we're not stuck there because emptiness is empty itself. So we're not stuck there. We haven't reified again the crown of emptiness to then be something. But instead from, from there, we, from there, so we could say that there's no intentionality and intentionality of the stylus, of the creator at the same time. So it's like the avoiding, yeah. it's the avoiding of the void, but, you, but you've but you experienced both now, you taste both now, you are both simultaneously, non-existence, existence, non-being, being, et cetera. So it's yes. the, you, you, you are the entanglement of that simultaneity, the superposition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's excellent. Yeah. And to be it is most important, like you shared a bit ago too. It's about being it. Like you want the beingness of that entanglement or that superposition. You want the frequency or the vibration of it. And so to teach that um, is, is core, is key. Yeah. Richard Boyle has also written a book, by the way. It has, uh, the book has a list of interviews with people, including Shinsen Yang, the one he, one you mentioned, Shinsen, and uh, a few other teachers. He has uh, interviewed a lot of people asking about what happened in their lives, you know, how they view reality after transformation. And that is also a good source uh, I don't, I think it's, uh, let me see if I can find that book. Maybe I can let you know the name of the book. Yeah, it's called Realizing Awakened Consciousness. Interviews with Buddhist teachers and a new respect of the mind. And that's uh, like, you know, he's done it in a very scientific way. And uh, it is also something that can be, it is like a database similar to your YouTube channel, you know teachers uh, of awakening, explaining about what they went through. And then there is a textbook of transpersonal psychiatry. That will be a good book if somebody is actually studying transpersonal psychology, you know, and uh, that is actually a very good field. Maybe, you know, it is very promising. It's going to be a promising field in the future. In the next 10 years, you know, a lot of people, we might have vacancies, job vacancies and things like that, and that because it is a very promising field of study. And this is, I think this is the, the only textbook available for that field. It has everything, document, you know, articles from many people, including Ken Wilbur and uh, many people who have done research on this. Awesome recommendations, those two. Textbook of Transpersonal Psychiatry and Psychology and Realizing Awakened Consciousness, Interviews with Buddhist Teachers and a New Perspective on the Mind. Um, awesome, yeah. awesome book recommendations also. 
Um, I can put those in the bio also to the video. I think that's great to have these um, all in the bio. Um, nice, bro. So good. Um, and I love another thing that you mentioned, I think super important is um, the empathy gap. Um, <clears throat> that's why the Bodhisattva vow is so prominent also, because um, the, in a sense, the Bodhisattva vow is the, um, like your heart, it's like the meta component is still so prominent. And it, um, and it is um, where you, where you feel yourself as the totality, and you um, with your paintbrush, your stylus, that you're drawn to express in a way that shepherds the rest of life awakening. Um, and that way there's no empathy gap because otherwise, um, the empathy gap can grow too big with no intentionality. Um, yes. Yeah. And yeah. then, and then we're, um, and then we're in a sense, we're watching another self that is trapped in story. And then the pointing is too absolute, you could say. Um, and yeah, because it wouldn't have worked like for me 10 years ago, no way, like an absolute pointing wouldn't have worked to snap me out of story. Um, so there was just, yes, yes, yes. yeah, there was the incremental dissolving of the story. Yeah. 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 And uh, the one thing is, you know, a lot of these traditions, they isolated from the social life. Like for example, in Buddhism, uh, people who uh, were seeking enlightenment, they renounced everything. They lived in monasteries. And in one way it is like, you know, you're experimenting things in a, in a, in a professional settings. Like for example, using a drug uh, in a doctor's office under his supervision, you know, there are a lot of experienced people who have already went through awakening. You're separating yourself from the social life under their supervision, you're trying out all the medication and things like that. It was a convenient way, but the thing is, it compromises on the, the social, the, the growth of, you know, how an individual can perform. Your performance and skills, that is compromised. Like when you face the society, when you pay bills, when you go to work, or when you are living in the society, just like everyone else, it is very different. You are training your brain to think like everybody else, at least to some extent. You are witnessing the, their problems. And yeah, in modern times, it is very, very necessary because uh, these days people don't want to go to monastery. That is not a good idea either. You know, it is the best thing to do is just live your life and then uh, bring these spiritual practices as a part of your life without compromising on anything. You know, your relationship, your work, everything should go smoothly. And that is a bit tricky because a lot of people complain, you know, about their spouses getting too spiritual, too meditative, and that creates class you know so uh, you know maybe in the future uh, you know with the work of a lot of people we might have a very efficient way of doing all these things you know monitoring exactly when science grows uh, enough to study this more efficiently we can document everything that happens you know how their marital life is affected how their uh, performance and job changes because it is like a double-edged sword on one side you are able to be in the present moment, focus and do your job well. But the other side, the, the when you when you progress spiritually, you are get, giving less importance to all the materialistic things, pushing for promotion, competing, you know, with other people and things like that. And that was uh, a challenge for me too. Like you know, after 2014 for six months, I even forgot why I was going to office. I was working in a call center. And uh, it was like for six months, it, I went very deep in meditation. It was every, after every, finishing every call, the wait time, I was just focusing on what is going on inside me, how my body was moving, each and every impulse. And I was listening, I was performing amazingly. In fact, there is a quality department which gave me a very good mark for addressing everything on the call, a complete call. But my sales performance was declining because I was not pushing customers to buy the product it is like that you know in, inbound call center and i have to push and 
usually people, I mean, it, it, uh, the temptation is incentives, but I didn't care about incentives much or promotion or anything like that. I forgot it completely. And that is what will become a challenge for spiritual seekers these days, how they meet the expectations of other people around you. You know, like everybody else has a pride about you too. You, your spouse, your girlfriend or boyfriend, your son, they are proud of you, even though you're not proud of yourself. I mean, that pride is doesn't, it doesn't have the same meaning anymore for you, but it does for other people who, you know, who, yeah. So in some way there has to be some kind of empathy. We can't simply dismiss that as an unconscious behavior. It is just an expected behavior of everybody, you know, depending on the level that they are at, you know, the identification that they are going through. So I think that will be the, you know, the next thing that can happen, which might benefit people. Yeah, this is cool. So a analysis of this first stage awakening and the way that it both, let's say, plays into the uh, empowerment, let's call it empowerment and enlightenment. So enlightenment is the turn inward all the way. And empowerment is the exciting expression of life outward creatively. And so, yeah, yeah. so then, so we could have an analysis of first stage awakening, enlightenment, the turn inward, and the way that it affects the turn outward in terms of potentially, let's say some in sometimes this decrease in like intentionality or like drive for empowered success must uh, earn money and prove worthiness and increase self-image for sure. Those things like tend to decrease. Um, but what's interesting is with that analysis, we can also see that the purity of the expression when it does express in its empowered creative state is much less about wanting to get self-image or wanting to get worthiness or validation um, because it comes from a whole place that has no lack. And it comes from a place of wanting to shepherd the rest of life awakening from that Bodhisattva vow. So I think that that's a powerful way of viewing it. What we just got to this like analysis of the effect that enlightenment has on empowerment. That's cool. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, while we're talking, I'm taking notes. And I feel like there might be a deeper collaboration or creation between us where we hone in on this exact theme. And I'm, I'm seeing it come up more and more between the other selves that I'm getting tighter and tighter with is that we're honed in on basically like different angles on this exact theme, like the synthesis of science and spirituality and whatnot. And, and it's exciting feeling about creating with you for sure. Yeah. It's me too. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, amazing. Amazing to talk about it and, uh, you know, move things forward in that direction. And it also feels like when these, let's say two points in the tablecloth come together from very awakened places that their dance is quite empowered and accelerative. The like exchange of symbols from an empty place is like really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, and with the interaction, you know, as you mentioned, you know, uh, there is an uniqueness to everyone's viewpoints. They have, it's all complementary, and uh, you know, um, so it helps to get more clarity on this, I mean, how things are, uh, things are affected. 
everybody has their own story to tell about um, you know what happened after awakening and you know uh, things that changed their perspectives and things like that and also one more thing that i want to bring up is uh, the uh, neurodiversity the concept of neurodiversity it is a very interesting concept because a lot of people that i have uh, spoken with they have problems like adhd autism bipolar disorder and uh, a lot of people and uh, even shinsen he had adhd he suffered from adhd and uh, it looks like uh, you know uh, these things are not really disorders it is just that they have some uniqueness they are different and um i think uh, adhd might be very common among spiritual seekers so we might even get clarity on these things what exactly is adhd and how we can um, you know uh, help people who have these symptoms because it is certainly not a disorder it is just that they are motivated because of things like novelty if something is novel something is challenging you're going for it and these kind of people are needed for society they don't have a disorder they just can't live like everybody else they always are in pursuit of new creative things they take risks they get distracted very easily because a lot of things are interesting in the world so it is not that they don't have a prop they have a problem in paying attention it is just that regulating their attention is difficult because a lot of things catch their eyes and uh, um so it is like you know they have more uh, like you know uh, they they indeed have more potential but when the life is like you know you're repeating the same thing every day you know um uh, it is not challenging for them and they can't do that job well you know i had adhd myself i just didn't know that it had a name for it uh only recently i realized uh that it is adhd that i was suffering from and it is misunderstood a lot um people uh, it is it is thought as a lack of attention but it is more like you know you either don't focus at all or you hyper focus when you find something that uh, that you like you just do it i mean uh, without even you get into a state of flow so that is what happens with adhd people and uh, yeah that is uh, like you know it, it, there is an overlap between these uh, um the the disorders in the spectrum and uh, the spiritual seeking they always even allowed to ask questions uh, you know to people if they were uh, you know they have adhd or things like that sometimes you know if it is relevant because uh, yeah i'm i'm speaking to a uh, people a lot who have these problems they have bipolar disorder uh, you know or autism things like that do you have any experience of i mean getting these uh, like you know uh, talking to people who bring up this topic the same thing yeah this is great i love this topic as well um one that came up not only adhd and bipolar but also autism is another one so yes. it's it's this like you described already so well um there's a like there's a hyper activity around novelty and around um becoming like masterful and um and not fitting into the matrix um at all and yeah. there's the spectrum i think like we said is really important where there's um very like you could say um it can be really tough to be um plagued by let's say ADHD or bipolar or autism in ways that are um non um don't serve enlightenment and empowerment let's say but when it does serve it which as on let's say the good side of the spectrum i mean the amount of times that i've been called uh autistic or ADHD or bipolar i can already say for the last like 15 years i've been um called or like um diagnosed and that every time there was every time there was something inside that was no no like 
I don't need your pharmaceuticals. Like I, I don't, I actually don't want to calm that down. There's something about it that is so true about um, what's being activated here. And I just, yeah. I also, yeah. And I also feel the importance of how um, we could say like the negative polarity of the one or of creation can come through the matrix agenda, can come through the big pharma companies and can come through the, um, the, the quenching of the, of the drive of the awakening out of the matrix by plaguing with these um, pharmaceutical recipes for the quelling of said accelerative potential states um, of exploration. So I, that's another interesting component because I've had several friends that were, oh my gosh, lit up in their journey of awakening and then bang, um, got prescribed pharmaceuticals because family uh, pressured them and whatnot. And then boom, um, all of a sudden it's like back to zombie. What the fuck? Back to unconscious. Yeah. 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 It needs more uh, like, you know, I think uh, this field needs to grow a lot uh, when it comes to the mental disorders. There is something, you know, that we don't know yet about these disorders very clearly. So. You know, so I think that it is not really a disorder, uh, like, for example, bipolar, it's uh, probably, you know, it has a, you know, we don't have a complete picture yet. And there's a lot of misdiagnosis too, a lot of, in this area, people can be misdiagnosed very easily, a lot of confusion, even doctors do not know much about, for example, one doctor I talked to, he didn't know that adults can have ADHD. Like it is not something that only affects children. It is just a lifelong, it is like a trait actually. And there is a, there is actually, I don't, I don't remember the name of the person who said it, but it is a, he's a doctor. And he gave a different name. It is called VAST, V-A-S-T, Variable Attention Stimulus Trait. Uh, people who are labeled as ADHD people are actually, they have, their nervous system works in a different way. They have interest-based nervous system, not importance-based nervous system, which means that they don't do things based on what is important. They are always, uh, you know, they are motivated. Their attention is directed based on interests, passion, and novelty is another important factor too. You know, if something is novel, they are bound to do it. And yeah, there is also emotional hyper, you know, reaction sensitivity and also emotion emotional sensitivity too. Like they have intense emotions. And, and uh, so it looks like, you know, he has a more clear way of uh, putting it, well, telling exactly what it is, you know. And, Personally, I suffered from a lot of issues and, and I didn't even know what was wrong. It was like, you know, for me, it was, uh, uh, everyone usually says that my childhood was wonderful. And then after that, it became, you know, hectic. And then I lost the fun that I had in childhood. For me, it is totally the opposite. Childhood was less fun. It was miserable. And then, you know, it improved. And now it is like, I am the happiest, uh, like, you know, it is, uh, sometimes feel like I'm the happiest person around. I couldn't, you know, I, I can't really find anybody else who is this happy, you know. And, uh, but my childhood was entirely the opposite. It was like, you know, I something is wrong with me. And uh, I didn't know how to explain the problem. And a uh, lot of things happened. And, uh, you know, I wish, I mean, some, I mean, I, mean, I, I really think that it should uh, improve so that we don't have, uh, I mean, uh, other people do not face the same problem or go through the same situation, the struggles and everything that I went through. Yeah, which is ultimately what we're passionate about is, um, yeah, the generation of content that shepherds life awakening without falling into the same pitfalls and struggles that we went through. And yes, that's, yes, that's huge. And then, yes, yes. um, 
another thing that uh, that came up while while you were sharing was, of course, to not forget uh, the infamous schizophrenia. That's another one. Yeah. Um, so to add that to our list, because um, there's a clear spectrum there as well, where it can be totally disastrous, but where it's also like, it is awakening. Like your, your sense of quote reality yeah. is no longer the world and the stories. Um, and so of yes, course, yes. yeah, yeah. So of course it can be, that's another one that came up for friends as well is that it was a diagnosis as they were awakening of schizophrenia by their like family and the friends. And then, um, mm. Uh, and then just getting pumped with pharmaceuticals. Yes. Yes. But, it happens a lot. Yeah, I know. Yep. Um, basically, this new analysis of um, awakening from a psychiatric angle is going to be crucial as well. Yeah, that's yes. the yes. sum of it. To yeah. Uh, Yes, because uh, since you mentioned schizophrenia, I think, uh, you know, I can say something about it too. Um, schizophrenia, one of the symptoms is when a person is not taking care of himself, like grooming, for example, not dressing properly, not wearing good clothes, that is a symptom of schizophrenia. And as a person who is spiritually inclined is more likely to, I mean, less likely to take care of these things, like, you know, grooming and things like that, wearing impressive clothes. He is more interested in meditating and things like that. And, you know, that, yeah, a lot of other things too. Uh, like, for example, even talking about things like Aham Brahmasmi, it can be misunderstood very easily, like a delusion. Like another symptom of schizophrenia, he thinks he is God. So <laughs> that is like a case of schizophrenia, right? But uh, it is not really the case. A lot of people don't understand these words like Aham Brahmasmi and, uh, um, you know, <laughs> things like that. So yeah, there are a lot of uh, misdiagnoses that can happen and transpersonal psychology, in fact, uh, in the textbook of transpersonal psychiatry and psychology, you can see this mentioned. Uh, the, the main reason why this field evolved as a separate science is because of this misdiagnosis happening to people who go through spiritual awakening. They are diagnosed as somebody who is having a mental disorder or schizophrenia, things like that. Even about Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, I think there is a book. I have not read it, but the book is about he had some kind of temporal lobe epilepsy or something. And uh, yeah, it's, it happens a lot. It's very common. But I think this field itself needs a lot of introduction. Transpersonal psychology is uh, only if, we, if people know about it, a lot of people will actually study the material or, you know, they will show interest and uh, just uh, just experiencing meditation for like you know 15 days retreat they, it can actually help them to get a glimpse or really understand what it is about you know all they have to do is just one meditation retreat or something but the people are really scared about meditation in general because uh, of you know getting into cults or you know because of promises false promises that are made in, na in the name of spirituality things like that so if, if it's made scientific, then, you know, uh, that is the only thing that they need, like, you know, an experience of meditation or even using psychedelics and therapeutic, you know, medically supervised conditions. That is discussed a lot in this book, Transpersonal Psychiatry. A lot of research have been done on various psychedelics. They have the power to give a glimpse, you know, show what is possible. But again, yeah, it has a downside too. You can be on psychedelics all the time and that would be, you know, that wouldn't be good for your brain. You're training your brain, giving a different perception of reality to your brain. Your brain is not getting trained to face the actual challenging situation, you know, that is in front of you. Yeah, because managing something when you have a drug in your uh, brain is, might be easy. And you're not seeing the actual picture. You're, you're not really seeing. It is like doing a bench press with a uh, supported bench press or, you know, working out in a gym, but you're not using free weights. You're using some machines. It makes things easy, but it is not really an effective way, right, all the time. You have to face the actual stress. 
but yeah chemicals do help in opening up people making them open minded making them realize what is possible i think in the future we may we might have non duality pills or something like that mm -hmm. some kind of you know swallow a pill you have a glimpse of non duality which like is what way. it's what entheogens are you know, magic mushrooms yes. LSD, 5 meo dmt etc are all um usually um glimpse generators and yeah, yeah. and another analogy to this is taking a gondola up the mountain with the entheogen which again just means unleashing god or the divine from within and then the gondola comes right back down after getting to the peak and so very similar to your analogy of using the assisted um weight machines um so the entheogen is a glimpse generator and then it's up to the individuation to further generate more of the natural state that the entheogen glimpsed for them in essence yeah and that's not an easy process because it's totally deconstructive it's destructive because um there are so many uh, I've also called them neuro knots. So they're like neural knots, tangles, right? And that to untangle them, um, to not have these trigger cascades happen in the proliferation, conceptual mental, it requires concentration. It requires meditation. It requires this like this depth of self inquiry that is not for um we the weak it's it's really only there for those that want it so bad and so it's just like yeah. it's just like picking up a musical instrument or picking up a sport um or picking up entrepreneurship you know the statistics keep changing but it's somewhere around like 95 or 98 percent of entrepreneurs fail uh their businesses that they started in uh within 10 years and that's the thing that you're that we're sort of um it's the same drive that when you wake up every morning for your entrepreneurial success um or for your sport or your musical instrument success is the same thing for self inquiry and focus and meditation success. So that it's that level that um, dissolves the neural knots that are um, constricting our expression. And I found that the neural knot is um, in many ways like um, another good way of, of, uh, of tying in neuroscience of neurology with um, awakening because it is like, uh, it's basically ossified pathways that are that the individuation can't easily liberate themselves from so they become so yeah, yeah. so associated with their name ah i am atlas i have these five symbols that are strung together that define me and who i am and so you know one of the greatest ones is to dislodge in self-inquiry those little string of symbols that we've attached to this piece of life things like that yes yes Actually, the, the word not is, uh, I think, is a really good word uh, word choice because even in Sanskrit, we have a word called granthi. You might have heard about it. Granthi, and uh, it, it literally means not. And uh, we have knots that we need to, you know, untie. Like, so that is a, a perfect analogy, not, because that is exactly what it is. Like, you know, once it is free, once the knot is untied, there are a lot of such knots, actually. Uh, you know, there might be in in yoga, they talk about three knots. One knot is called as Brahma, Brahma Granthi. Brahma Granthi is about 
your uh, the knot that this that is that is uh, you know everybody is entangled in that knot it is about survival you need to earn money you need to follow what everybody else is following you need to have a big house so it is all about survival and security the next knot vishnu granthi is conceptual the conceptual knot it is about me the ego i have to do this i have to accomplish this it is all about conceptual you know the personal growth i have to improve this and that i have to so that is about me and then the one is about the ultimate like you know uh, the the identification the, the second one is conceptual about all the knots not just self it is about my country it is about my group it is about all concepts that we carry including the religious concepts so conceptual knot and the third knot is actually the knot of the actual duality i am different and the existence is different that is the final knot once the other two knots are untied the last knot which is about the separation the knot of separation can be also removed and then there is no separation at all so yeah that's a really good word actually so let's play with that a little bit more um because sure. i love that so granti uh not in sanskrit so cool so i love also how the not can be applied to the blockages in the chakras of the energy flow is another one and then the freedom from those unblockages so that's another great way to visualize the knots and then so let's see if i got this right so brahma vishnu and rudra and yeah so so brahma is sort of like the identification with others and world uh the brahma is like the basic like you know uh following the routine uh to have a secure life if, what everybody is trying to do in general you know i have to study i have to earn money i have to settle so it is more about the instinct of survival and security okay. cool and the next is conceptual more about the concepts that we are dealing with and the third is the uh you know the separation mm -hmm. okay cool so so the first one can be kind of like the matrix or like following the joneses or following the protocols of the collective and then then we have like an um we we could say like a um more of the that's more instinctual survival vishnu being more about um conceptual specifically you said like identity like me and identity right um cool yeah okay. all kinds of concepts that we that bind us you know the binding concepts it can be anything like religion or ambition okay, whatever okay cool, right? cool so binding concepts and then the last one being about duality rudra is the knot of duality which then liberates into from separation yes yes okay nice nice i love those i'm also going to um dive deeper into into that because i love that that's not yeah. in such a good way yeah to put it mm, yeah the, the the explanation that i gave it is like my interpretation because uh, you know it is like a lot of uh, different ways i mean that 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 these knots are explained but when i looked at all these definitions i this is what i came up with like a bottom line you know what i understood you know as meant by these knot from my perspective you know that's what uh, but yeah it's uh, i think it explains a lot not is it is uh, even after you untie it is the same but it becomes so simple right it doesn't have those complications wow i'm feeling so good about this first conversation together awesome yeah yeah me too it's been i think it's been talking for like more than an hour probably yeah on my end to uh, yeah. a little more than an hour um yeah yeah i'm feeling great like i'm feeling complete i feel like there could be another potential to explore on this first um oh well, yeah sure we can do that it's uh yeah it's it's an awesome discussion i i love that i mean what whatever we are discussing so far it's a <laughs> wonderful opportunity for me to you know connect with you Me too, brother. 
Me too. Especially the depth of, yeah. of understanding. Yeah. And the way that it um, springs up with, with you. Um, I feel a great amount of uh, resonance, magnetism, um, alignment, synchronicity. The puzzle pieces can fit well. Good. Yeah, I think in the future, we can talk a lot about the, um, the, the, the concepts discussed in transpersonal psychiatry textbook, you know, because that is something I feel like it needs to be known, you know. This textbook is it's very hard to read for people. I gave it to a few people and they said, you know, it's very complicated. It's very academic, but we can break it down in our discussions so that people find it easy to absorb. Like, you know, uh, people get introduced about all these work that has been done. Uh, it is there for, since 1968. So it's been, yeah, 50 years now. Uh, but this field is still not very well known and the hard work that has been done in this field is not really uh, very well known either. And we still find people who, you know, uh, think meditation is somewhat religious practice, doesn't have any value, you know. So this certainly needs a lot of uh, introduction to people. It can change lives when people are aware of all these possibilities. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Um, I love how um, we can like further um, together, especially um, the science spirituality synthesis, take it from that approach. And then that will automatically make it more familiar and friendly to mainstream audiences. Um, yes. Great. I love that. And that resonates. So we can, we can explore that on our on our next chats. Um, I just have some silly questions. What is your favorite? Oh, yeah, sure. What's your favorite food? Fav favorite food? Oh, it's, uh, <laughs> it keeps changing actually. Uh, I love uh, non-vegetarian food actually, fish. I love fish very much. It might sound very shocking for many people who are in non-duality. People always ask me, oh, do you eat non-vegetarian? Yeah, I do because uh, I grew up differently. Uh, for me, non-vegetarian food was like a, re a dream because I was in vegetarian family. So everybody is different. But yeah, I love baked fish. I bake myself. I have an oven and that, uh, that is very tasty. And uh, yeah, all kinds of uh, food. And these days I'm finding fruits and nuts also because I am moving to more healthier choices. I'm passionate about health, finding out about how this body works, you know, because uh, uh, human physiology is not like a subject anymore. It is about what this instrument, that is how I see it now. It can, we can see things as it is. It is like you have the user manual in your hand when you have a book about physiology. It, we learn about the cell, we, know, we learn about DNA. So I started exploring health and uh, I eat dry fruits, berries, you know, cranberries and uh, nuts. So all of them I like very much. Yeah, go ahead with uh, your other questions. Cool. What do you like for um, hobby? Do you like a specific like hobby? Um, I, I have a lot of hobbies actually. I try out everything. Singing, I, I'm learning music these days. Just uh, you know, when I when I take a walk in the morning, I learn classical music. That is a hobby. I work out, and that is a hobby for me. I mean, everything that I do is a hobby actually. Reading, you know, and then uh, been improving, working on all kinds of skills that I, you know, I I felt some kind of fear in even trying them out because of failure. But now it is no longer there. So why not do that? You know. I have all the time in the world and uh, I improving all kinds of skills, but mainly, you know, I'm interested in music these days, apart from the fitness, you know, I work out in gym for two hours and I'm also passionate about all these things, you know, because when we see things in our experience, um, it is very interesting. How do you feel about Sangha? or satsang like do you have a spiritual community around you that you feel like um you can 
be around that you can easily mm -hmm. yeah like uh um like feel a sense of uh like divine or powerful friendship brotherhood sisterhood with mm -hmm. i do have friends but it is more like online interaction. Uh, I'm connected to a lot of people who ask me questions. Sometimes we talk, but not very close to me. Only these days, I mean, very recently, people who know me personally, they are getting familiar with my YouTube videos and they're just, you know, uh, wondering and uh, uh, what it is all about. They are curious and, uh, you know, they realize that I'm doing something, but not really uh, in, like a satsang or something like that, very close. So it only happens like online. I meet people occasionally, video calls, chat, and uh, they sh we share our experiences. Both you know people who are seeking, who are trying to get to that point, and people who have already crossed. And that's how that's when I figured out that many people are, uh, you know, struggling with this question about intentionality. That seems to be a a weird state of uh, to be in, you know. Because society expects something different and you think that everything is perfect. I mean, you feel it is a feeling of nothing needs to be changed. Life is beautiful and perfect, right? Yeah, so there's something like, you know, uh, I'm actually working on things like how to make it more relatable to people. Because, you know, if you say the truth, like, for example, I wake up every day looking forward to how wonderful it is going to be, excited to face a new day. But if I say this to somebody else, they wouldn't be able to relate, relate to it. They kind of want to talk like how difficult and hectic things have been, you know, how difficult it is to get up in the morning, to do things. So it is like totally opposite. So yeah, I think uh, that, that is something that I am trying to find out, how to make it more, more relatable. You have to be honest. At the same time, you don't, you shouldn't irritate or people, you know, when you talk about it, when you talk about how amazing life is, that is uh, really weird because, you know, <laughs> Uh, it is uh, unfortunately people are uh, we are living in a world where people think that life is hectic life is but life is awesome that is exactly what it is you know it's amazing every day it is different unconscious like you're going is another way to yeah. say that yeah victim versus creator consciousness yeah yes 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 that's uh, yeah that's nice choice of words that is one friend that i have i talk to her often and uh, yeah, it's uh, she's from Iran. So it is like, you know, people are too far away from me, people that I talk to. There, there is a couple from Germany who are interested in my work. They actually came here, um, you know, twice to India. Uh, I met them and they are still in touch. And they have, uh, they are very old. They have seen Osho, Jay Krishnamurti and many other people in real life. And uh, they, they allowed my book. The second book is not that, I mean, uh, selling, but uh, the first book is, uh, it has a lot of good reviews from people. It is about the science and spirituality. The second book is uh, about religions in general. I wrote a book just to explore the mystical aspects of all religions to show how, you know, uh, I, I thought that book will help reduce some conflicts so that people understand that each and every religion has a mystical aspect, which is pretty much the same, like Sufism in Islam, Christian mystic traditions all have this, you know, they have similar themes of uh, getting rid, rid of this, you know, illusion and uh, transforming their consciousness. But that book is not uh, that, I mean, uh, it is not very interesting for people, I, I guess. I have it here, the first, this is the second one. If you haven't seen it, you know, the first one is the truth about spiritual enlightenment. And this is the, the Discovering God book. I love you so much, bro. Yeah, I love you too. So cool. I really feel like the one um, deeply in you. And like when you're holding up your books, like I just feel so much uh, happiness and so much um, like relatability, like deeply. Um, if you, you yeah if you will at like the soul level at um at that level of the depth of what's possible right yeah <sighs>
And I love the focus on relatability um, and especially like bridging into the victim consciousness because we were there 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. And just the small incremental things, but also the bigger like quantum leaps to make those available at the same time for, or the cosmic leaps, if you will, um, for um, the other selves to feel less suffering and to feel more um, of the divine perfection, yes. to feel more of the no separation. Yeah. Wholeness automatically. And then to create from there. Yeah. I feel really good about this, um, about you and I and what we can um, further create together. Do you also have any like desire to, because you say um, most of the people that you engage with most often are further away from you. Um, do you also have desire to um, like live among, like as we build Shambhala, the spiritual kingdom, as that gets actualized on the planet? um are you interested in uh like joining to come and live together with powerful spiritual community that ends up getting into the thousands and millions of people um that are all um about the same vibration sure yeah that will be that will be great to meet people and um you know live with them but i don't um have much idea about it maybe i would have to explore the shambhala i mean whatever your your plans but yeah it's it's uh it's it sounds like a wonderful thing to do beautiful yeah i'll uh <clears throat> i'll share um, some of that um with you sure. online um a little bit online just um like yeah, if you imagine heaven on earth and you imagine paradise on earth and um, all basic needs being met, um, the creator potential being so effortlessly activated. Anytime you want to generate something, it's just there um, with whatever technologies that are needed. Um, energy is so abundant um the playfulness the innocence the spiritual alignment that that vibration the radiance of love and light um this like very natural uh ecological integration with uh, technology and with civilization um the the freedom just total freedom um unity oneness just that um level of abundance and that level of choice and freedom and that level of being amongst other selves of that same caliber of that same frequency and then creating from there and then of course merging with our galactic friends at the same time so yep. so getting nice. ready for that um yeah so all of that it's very interesting yeah and um so that's being actualized right now and we'll keep sort of um sharing about it um as much as we feel is is right um along the journey online but offline i can also share a little bit more um and yeah and the best place to get involved also the link is always in the bio for what we're building it's called no limit society um hundreds of people from around the world um waking up becoming free agents for the ignition of global awakening and um it's, it's perfect so yeah bentinho masaro the team here um and the mission is just, there's nothing like it. Um, there's nothing like this mission. Um, yeah, it's the, it's the Bodhisattva vow. And it's, um, and it's also um, building heaven on earth, paradise on earth, and to not just 
be so non-intentional that um, the matrix forces take over. So, um, so the building of Shambhala is the um, obsoleting of the oppressive matrix contractive um, forces. And so, um, yeah, so that's, that's all. Yeah, it sounds wonderful. Yeah, it's, it looks like an amazing plan to help people and, you know, to make these things available for everyone. Yeah, exactly. And then it radiates out as like a radiates out a frequency or a transmission to the collective for those that are seeking union to come to Shambhala's where their basic needs can be met, where they can actualize them knowing themselves fully. Um, they can actualize that potential. So, um, and just be so abundant. Like the abundance is such a big key. Like it's such a big key, like feeling abundant, like being, that's such a big yeah. key to freedom. Like so many of the contracted knots are in the feelings of lack. So, yeah. Yeah. Sweet, bro. I feel really good about this episode. This first one we did together. I feel really good about our brotherhood. It's so nice. Yeah, I, me too. That's a very good, interesting. Yeah. We went over a lot of things today. Yeah. And I think this, the, introducing these books and, uh, you know, the subject is going to be useful for many people. Because I think Richard Boyle's work needs a lot of attention. It, uh, it, I was very impressed. Even I made a video on his... Uh, you know, work. And I also sent them some emails. We communicated, you know, maybe we can, yeah. So I think you'll be also happy to know that his book is, I mean, reaching many people. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And maybe even at some point, if he's feeling it, we could have a, like a three person conversation. That could be fun. Yes. That'll be wonderful. Yeah. I have to just connect with him again. It's been a month, a few months. Last time I sent him an email. Cool. Yeah, sweet. I'll have all of those links that we discussed in the bio below. And also, <clears throat> thanks, everybody. We love you so much. Thanks for tuning into this episode. And we would love to hear from you in the comments below on how the episode um, resonated for you, what some of your key takeaways were, um, where you're at in your journey, um, maybe uh, Sean Mugam and I can actually jump into the comments and um, and respond to you and engage with you there. Um, we would love for you to also like the video if it brought you value, helps the algorithm. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Um, also share the video with um, those that you feel like this would profoundly impact and resonate with. And similarly, this conversation is going to be up on Sean Mugam's channel as well. And you can find um, his channel in the links of uh, the bio of this video. And then I'll give him the links to, um, to our channel simulation as well. And he can put those in the bio. So also subscribe to his channel, go check out his videos, um, like his content. If it brings you value, share his content, that type of stuff. You can find his book links also, um, the truth about spiritual. It's enlightenment, yeah. The Truth About Spiritual Enlightenment, also Discovering God, um, also his The Book of Quotes. You'll find all those links in the bio below. Um, so yeah, check him out and support him there. Support the synthesis of spirituality and science. Support that. Support that, baby. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Shamalim. Thanks, brother. Such thank a you. pleasure. Such pleasure. Cool. I'll end. Yeah, it was recording. amazing. It was so good. So good, my man. Um, I'm going to end yeah. the recording and then you and I can stay in the um, room for a bit and keep talking. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Bye, everyone.